64,000 is the median number of words per book. Average person reads about 200 words per minute. Simple math will tell us that is one book in 320 minutes. To accomplish this in seven days, numbers say you would have to read for 45 minutes a day. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that notification button, like, comment, and share. Enjoy. Hello, and happy day. How does slowing down sound to you today? Would you like to reduce the noise for just a bit? Are you ready to make a choice and decide to listen? My name is Igor, SF Walker. I am here to remind people to slow down, to reduce the noise, to walk their lives into a natural flow. Welcome back to the Book of the Week series. Every week as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world. Today we look at the E-Myth Revisited. Why most small businesses do not work and what to do about it. By Michael E. Gerber. In this video we look at a fatal assumption. If you understand the technical work of a business, you understand a business that does the technical work. And the reason it is fatal is that it just isn't true. In fact, it is the root cause of most small business failures. The technical work of a business and a business that does the technical work are two totally different things. But the technician who starts a business fails to see this. Stick around till the end. I will share with you some tools I haven't used that will help you tremendously in this game of life. Discover a way to find out what actually motivates you. What innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior. I will share some tools to improve your self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, and relationship management. The question has often been asked, what do the owners of extraordinary businesses know that the rest don't? Contrary to popular belief, experience has shown that the people who are exceptionally good in business aren't so because of what they know, but because of their insatiable need to know more. The problem with most failing businesses I've encountered is not that the owners do not know enough about finance, marketing, management, operations. They don't. But those things are easy enough to learn, but that they spend their time and their energy defending what they think they know. The greatest business people I've met are determined to get it right no matter what the cost. And by getting it right, we're not just talking about the business. I mean that there is something uplifting, some vision, some higher end in sight that getting it right would serve. An ethical certainty, a moral principle, a universal truth, which is not to say that those I am inclined to think of extraordinary would necessarily communicate it that way. Many can't. Even if they had the inclination, they simply don't have the words for it. But it's still there, all the same. You can see it in their eyes, feel it radiating from their bodies. You can hear it in the timbre of their voices. On the other hand, notwithstanding the search for something higher, the best of the best are extraordinarily grounded people. They're compulsive about detail, pragmatic. They're down to earth. They're in touch with the seamy reality of ordinary life. They know that a business doesn't miss a mark by failing to achieve greatness in some lofty principled way. But in the stuff 
that goes on in every nook and cranny of the business of the telephone between the customer and the salesperson on the shipping dock at the cash register and so the great ones I've known seem to possess an intuitive understanding that the only way to reach something higher is to focus their attention on the multitude of seemingly insignificant, unimportant and boring things that make up every business and that make up every life for that matter. Idea number one, there's a myth, call it the E-myth, which says that small businesses are started by entrepreneurs risking capital to make a profit. This is simply not so. The real reason people start businesses have little to do with entrepreneurship. In fact, this belief in the entrepreneurial myth is the most important factor in the devastating rate of small business failure today. Understanding the e-myth and applying that understanding to the creation and development of a small business can be the secret to any business success. Idea number two. There's a revolution going on today in the American small business. I call it the turnkey revolution. Not only is it changing the way we do business in this country and throughout the world, but it is changing who goes into business, how they do it, and the likelihood of their survival. Idea number three. At the heart of the turnkey revolution is a dynamic process, the business development process. <clears throat> when it is systematized and applied purposely by the small business owner, a business development process has the power to transform any small business into an incredibly effective organization. And idea number four, the business development process can be systematically applied by any small business owner in a step-by-step -step method that incorporates the lessons of the turnkey revolution into the operation of that business. This process then becomes a predictable way to produce results and vitality in a small business whose owner is willing to give it the time and attention it requires to flourish. The technician suffering from an entrepreneurial seizure, takes the work he loves to do and then turns it into a job. The work that was born out of love becomes a chore among a welter of other less familiar and less pleasant chores. Rather than maintaining it, its specialness representing the unique skill that the technician possesses and upon which he started the business. The work becomes trivialized, something to get through, through in order to get room for everything else that must be done. Every technician suffering from the entrepreneurial seizure experience experiences exactly the same thing. First exhilaration, second terror, third exhaustion, and finally despair. It is not that we are indecisive or unreliable. It is that each and every one of us is a whole set of different personalities, each with its own interests and ways of doing things. Asking any one of them to defer to any of the others is inviting a battle or even a full stage war. Anyone who has ever experienced the conflict between the fat guy and the skinny guy, and haven't we all, knows what I mean. You cannot be both. One of them has to lose, and they both know it. Well, that's the kind of war going on inside the owner of every small business. But it is a three-way battle between the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician. And unfortunately, it's a battle no one can win. The entrepreneurial personality turns the most trivial condition into an exceptional opportunity. The entrepreneur is the visionary in us, the dreamer, the energy behind every human activity, imagination that sparks the fire of the future, the catalyst for change. The entrepreneur lives in the future, never in the past, rarely in the present. 
He's happiest when left free to construct images of what if and if when. The entrepreneur is our creative personality, always at its best, dealing with the unknown, prodding the future, creating possibilities and probabilities out of possibilities, engineering chaos into harmony. Every strong entrepreneurial personality has the extraordinary need for control. Living as he or she does in the visionary world of the future, he or she needs control of people and events in the present so that they can concentrate on their dreams. Given the need for change, the entrepreneur creates a great deal of havoc around him or her, which is predictably unsettling for those he enlists in his projects. As a result, he often finds himself rapidly outdistancing the others. The further ahead she is, the greater the effort required to pull her cohorts along. The problem is how can he pursue the opportunities without getting mired down by the feet? The way he usually chooses is to bully, harass, to flatter, to casual, to scream, to finally, when all else fails, promise whatever he must to keep the project moving. To the entrepreneur, most people are problems that get in the way of the dream. Now the managerial personality is pragmatic. Without the manager, there would be no planning, no order, no predictability. The manager is the part of us that goes to Sears and buys stacking plastic boxes, takes them back to the garage, and then systematically stores all the various size nuts, bolts, and screws in their own carefully identified drawer. If the entrepreneur lives in the future, the manager lives in the past. Where the entrepreneur craves control, the manager craves order. Where the entrepreneur thrives in change, the manager compulsively clings to the status quo. Where the entrepreneur invariably sees the opportunity in the events, the manager invariably sees the problem. The manager builds a house and then lives in it forever. The entrepreneur builds a house and the instant it is done, begins planning the next one. Without the manager, there could be no business. Without the entrepreneur, there would be no innovation. It is the tension between the entrepreneur's vision and the manager's pragmatism that creates the synthesis from which all great works are born. The technician is the doer. If you want it done right, do it yourself, is the technician's credo. The technician loves to thinker. Things are to be taken apart and then put back together again. If the entrepreneur lives in the future and the manager lives in the past, the technician lives in the present. He loves the feel of things and the fact that the things can't be done. To the technician, thinking is unproductive unless it's thinking about the work that needs to be done. As a result, he is suspicious of lofty ideas or abstractions. Thinking isn't work, it gets in the way of work. Put another way, while the entrepreneur dreams, the manager frets and the technician ruminates. The fact of the matter is that we all have an entrepreneur, a manager and a technician inside of us. And if they were equally balanced, we would be describing an incredibly competent individual. The entrepreneur would be free to forge ahead into new areas of interest. The manager would be solidifying the base of operation and the technician would be doing the technical work. Unfortunately, our experience shows that few people who go into business are blessed with such a balance. Instead, typical small business owner is only 10% entrepreneur, 20% manager and 70% technician. An entrepreneurial business without a manager to give it order and without a technician to put it to work is doomed to suffer an early and probably very dramatic death. And that a manager driven business without an entrepreneur or a technician to play their absolutely critical roles will put things into little gray boxes over and over again, only to realize too late that there is no reason for the things or the boxes to put them into. 
such a business will die very neatly. And in a technician driven business, without the entrepreneur to lead her and the manager to supervise her, the technician will work until she drops only to wake up the next morning to go to work even harder and the next and the next only to discover long after it's too late that while she was working someone moved a freeway through the store the technician's boundary is determined by how much he can do himself the manager's is defined by how many technicians she could supervise Effectively, or how many subordinate managers can she organize into a productive cohort? The entrepreneur's boundary is a function of how many managers she can engage in the pursuit of her vision. As the business grows, it invariably exceeds its owner ability to control, to touch, feel, and see the work that needs to be done, and to inspect its progress personally, as every technician needs to do. Simply put, your job is to prepare yourself and your business for growth, to educate yourself sufficiently so that as your business grows, the business's foundation and structure can carry the additional weight. If it is up to you to dictate your business of growth as best as you can by understanding the key processes to be performed, the key objectives that need to be achieved, the key positions you're aiming your business to hold in the marketplace. Most people who go into business don't have a model of a business that works, but of work itself, a technician's perspective, which differs from the entrepreneurial perspective in the following ways. The entrepreneurial perspective asks the question, how must the business work? The Technician asks what work has to be done. The entrepreneurial perspective sees the business as a system for producing outside results for the customers, resulting in profits. Now, the technician's perspective sees the business as a place in which people work to produce inside results for the technician producing income. The entrepreneurial perspective starts with a picture of a well-defined future and then comes back to the present with the intention of changing it to match the vision. Now, the technician perspective starts with the present and then looks forward to an uncertain future with the hope of keeping it much like the present. The entrepreneurial perspective envisions the business in its entirety from which it is derived and it's derived from its parts. The technician perspective envisions the business in parts from which it is constructed as a whole. The entrepreneurial perspective is an integrated vision of the world. The technician's perspective is a fragmented vision of the world. The entrepreneur, the present day world, is modeled after her vision. To the technician, the future is modeled after the present day world. The entrepreneurial perspective adopts a wider, more expansive scale. It views the business as a network of seamlessly integrated components, each contributing to some larger pattern that comes together in such a way as to produce a specifically planned result, a systematic way of doing business. Each step in the development of the business is measurable if not quantitatively, at least qualitatively. There's a standard for the business, a form, a way of being that can be translated into things to do. At best, exemplify it. The business operates according to articulated rules and principles. It has a clear, recognizable form. Once you recognize that the purpose of your life is not to serve your business, but that the primary purpose of your business is to serve your life, we can then go to work on your business rather than in it with a full understanding of why it is absolutely necessary for you to do so. This is where you can put the model of the franchise prototype to work for you. Where working on your business rather than in your business will become the central theme of your daily activity, the prime catalyst 
for everything we do from this moment forward. Pretend that the business you own or want to own is the prototype or will be the prototype for 5,000 more just like it. Pretend that you're going to franchise your business. Note, I said pretend. I'm not saying that you should. This isn't the point here, unless, of course, you want it to be. Game. Understand that there are rules to follow if you are to win. Number one, the model would provide consistent value to your customers, employees, suppliers, and lenders beyond what they expect. Number two, the model would be operated by people with the lowest possible level of skill. Number three, the model will stand out as a place of impeccable order. Number four, all work in the model will be documented in the operations manuals. Number five, the model will provide a uniformly predictable service to the customer. Number six, the model will utilize a uniform color, dress, or a facilities code. Go to work on your business rather than in it. Go to work on your business as if it were the pre-production prototype of a mass producible product. Think of your business as a something apart from yourself, as a world of its own, as a product of your efforts, as a machine designed to fulfill a very specific need, as a mechanism for giving you more life, as a system of interconnected parts, as a package of cereal, as a can of beans, as something created to satisfy your customers' deeply held perceived needs as a placement acts distinctly different from all other places as a solution to somebody else's problems. Think of your business as anything but a job. How can I get my business to work but without me? How can I get my people to work but without my constant interference? I can now systematize my business in such a way that it could be replicated 5,000 times so that all 5,000 and the 5,000th unit would run as smoothly as the first. How can I own my business and still be free of it? How can I spend my time doing the work I love to do rather than the work I have to do? While going to work on the business, people begin to realize that it is a powerful metaphor for going to work on their lives. That, I believe, is the heart of the process. Not efficiency, not effectiveness, not more money, not to downsize or get lean, but to simply and finally create more life for everyone who comes into contact with the business, and most of all, for you the person who owns it. Quality is just a word, an empty word at that, if it doesn't include harmony, balance, passion, intention, attention. Where business development program is the vehicle through which you can create your franchise prototype. The program is composed of seven distinct steps. Number one, your primary aim. Number two, your strategic objective. Number three, your organizational strategy, number four, your management strategy, number five, your people strategy, number six, your marketing strategy, and number seven, your systems strategy. Are you beginning to understand that the systematizing your business need not be a dehumanizing experience, but quite the opposite, that in order to get your people to do what you want, you first have to create an environment that will make it possible that hiring people, developing people, and keeping people requires a strategy both on an understanding completely foreign to most businesses that the system is indeed the solution that without an idea worth pursuing, there can be no people strategy at all. But with that idea, you can finally say, just as our young manager said, that's where we really shine. It is absolutely essential 
that you begin to think as your, of your business as a fully integrated system that to approach any part of your business as though it were separate from all the rest would be lunacy because everything in your business affects everything else in your business. That your primary aim and your strategic objective and your organizational strategy and your management strategy and your people strategy and your marketing strategy and your system strategy all of them are totally interdependent rather than independent of one another that the success of your business development program totally depends on your appreciation of that integration and that your prototype is the integration and there you have it the e-myth revised please do help out it is easy simply like this video so more people can enjoy it share it too and spread the word leave a comment and do share your thoughts subscribe to my channel and stay up to date and the link to this book is in the description below so buy it and read and never stop learning especially learning about yourself and nature so gift yourself by taking the free humanist test on my website and find out what actually motivates you what innate human need is driving all of your decisions and your behavior and if you feel you are ready to improve your self-awareness social awareness self-management and relationship management even further do check out my master of life awareness program the links are in the description below thank you love and respect